This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On November the 18th, our Security Studies Roundtable featured Iranian specialist Reza Akhlagi speaking on the topic Iran's geopolitical trajectory after the U.S.-Iran nuclear deal. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your warm presence. Uh, uh, because uh, Chris mentioned Paris uh, at the start of his introduction, uh, and we are going to talk about Iran and Iranian geopolitics, I just wanted you to let you know, I wanted to let you know that the Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, was due in Paris on Tuesday, um, that is yesterday. Um, he canceled all his plans. He was also... Uh, had a plan to visit Rome the, uh, in Italy. Uh, so he consulted uh, President, uh, the French President uh, Hollande on the phone and uh, expressed his support. And uh, maybe, as far as I know, uh, they are planning to reschedule his uh, trip to uh, Europe. Um, but I don't, I don't know if they have a yet date. So I wanted to start by an overview of the entire region. Um, there is a lot to cover, so I'm going to cover uh, as much as I can, uh, hopefully everything, and then uh, I greatly look forward to having a, a Q, uh, interactive, lively Q&A. Uh, and um, I, it is important for me to be able to uh, respond to your questions. Uh, uh, so what? One of the key, if not the key, aspect of uh, regional dynamics in the Middle East today is a, a competition, a geopolitical rivalry between Turkey, between two sides, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, um, and their proxies on one side, and Iran on the other side, with the United States split between the two, uh, and Russia, for strategic reasons, supporting Iran. Russia has not been always an Iranian ally. Iran has, nev has never been a solid Russian ally or a Chinese ally, but, but the developments in the region have drawn these states together to stand up to what they regard as um, uh, one, American hegemony, what they regard as American hegemony, and two, uh, what they uh, regard, uh, that is, China, Russia, and Iran, a very serious uh, threat from Sunni, Wahhabi, Saudi-supported uh, uh, Sunni Islam. Uh, that, that has the potential, in their perspective, to threaten, threaten their national security, their economies, all the way from Iran itself to Central Asia, the Caucasus, and to across Central Asia, all the way east to the westernmost part of China, specifically the Xinjiang province, uh, where, uh, where Chinese Muslim uh, it, a big province uh, and Muslim uh, dominated Chinese province. Um, and when we look at Iran, we should pay, uh, we should take into consideration to a number of important factors. Of course, on a daily basis or on an hourly basis, we hear about Iran being Shi Shiite and the rest of the Muslim world or Arabs being Sunni. And this is such a characterization that, that misses a lot of points. When we talk about Iran, we, we, you, need to, you need to pay attention to the fact that Iran is not just a country that happens to be Shiite dominated religiously. Iran is a cultural power. It is a cultural powerhouse with an imperial past. Um, that has been boxed in over the past three decades. And uh, it has the ability to influence events 
in its region and beyond. Um, so when we talk about the Iranian power, we are, yes, it is, a, it is a significant military power, uh, but it, 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 comes, it, it, it is a country with a long history of in, imperial, uh, imperial uh, uh, past. Um, and uh, it has dominated world history in a number of periods. Chiefly, I don't want to take too much of your time on that, but chiefly the Achaemenid dynasty, uh, where the Cyrus, uh, the Persian king Cyrus, uh, emerged. And um, as you know, Cyrus was the one who liberated the Jews from Babylon. And, and then the Sassanid uh, dynasty, or Sasanian dynasty, uh, that was in constant rivalry and uh, conflict uh, for much of its existence uh, with the uh, Romans. Um, and then we, today we, uh, it, it, a tectonic shift took place, as you know, in mid-July, and that is Joint Comprehension Plan of Action, uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, sorry, JCPOA, also known as the Iran Deal. Uh, so, it is important to know that the reason why it is a tectonic shift is that the United States, the world's sole superpower, uh, got into an agreement with Iran, a, a regional rising power, with, um, uh, and they have committed to, they, they have they have committed. Uh, they have. Uh, they agreed to a number of commitments on the on their parts. Um, post Iran deal, we are going to see, as we are seeing right now, impact of it on a number of fronts: uh, economics, uh, the the, rela the relationship between the West and Iran, and the ability of Iran to influence events. Whether you are, you are against. The, ri the rising influence of Iran, or you are um, sympathizing with the rising influence of Iran, that influence is going to shape things over the next few years and definitely decades. Um, and for Iran, the next step for the next step for Iran is is it, Iran has a key goal post. Iran deal to to re, to join to join the international community and consolidate its its position in the international community uh, and it will start by, by with the economy the Iranian economy has been uh, seriously very seriously weakened not just by sanctions it's not just only sanctions but also gross mismanagement and corruption and that Gross mismanagement and corruption has always been there, but it was basically, un unfortunately, institutionalized under the presidency of Ahmadinejad. Just to give you an idea of what I mean by widespread corruption and institutionalization of uh, corruption, uh, um, uh, the Rouhani government, the current government, is still trying to figure out what happened to over 500, 500 billion dollars with a B under the Ahmadinejad. They're still trying to figure out what happened to that half a trillion dollars. Um, <clears throat> so that is the depth of institutionalization of corruption under President Ahmadinejad and how he ravaged the Iranian economy. Uh, a friend of mine says that he should be awarded by the Israelis because <laughs> without, without one single Israeli soldier getting killed, or even injured, he managed to destroy the Iranian economy. So, um, and the, uh, what we are, as, as, the, as Iran tries to integrate into the international community, uh, one thing is very important to take, to pay attention to, the, the dynamics within Iran. There is a very interesting and important dynamics in, in Iranian politics and Iranian society. In Iranian society, you have, you have a force that is the general Iranian society uh, 
staying away from staying away from uh, hardline politics and becoming more and more what we can uh, what we can call um, more and more embracing what we can call Western uh, some of the Western values the 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 embrace in, embracing technology uh, pluralism and uh, respect for religious uh, minorities by the Iranian society this is this is in direct confrontation with the Iranian state ideology so this so this uh, collision has basically brought about has brought about a number of developments uh, these developments include uh, the uh, the realization on the part of Iranian power elite which currently mostly not 100% but most of them are hardline elements Th these are hardline anti-Israeli um, anti-American uh, and mostly pro-Chinese pro-Russian part of Iranian power elite Th the realization by this elite that they need to change some of their policies and the, and the realization that they, they need they, that they need to change the, the, some of their policies uh, also uh, was reinforced by by the sanctions that uh, that put a lot of pressure on the Iranian economy and when you, and when you put uh, when you, and when you mix those sanctions with the gross mismanagement the Iranian power elite saw that something really serious coming their way and that is the prospect of widespread social unrest if they don't get their act together because because internally the Iranian government is facing a crisis of legitimacy and that crisis of legitimacy comes from the collision of two very ideologically uh, opposed forces Iranian society uh, very young um, up to 60% of the Iranian society is uh, under 30, well-educated, a, a, a massive number of them hold university degrees, and the most, the most urbanized female population in the entire region. Um, and 68% of un Iranian university student body is female. Sixty-eight percent of all university students female. The rest men. To the point that uh, a few years ago, an Iranian cleric, a uh, hardline Iranian cleric, basically voiced concern openly uh, and said that uh, this is dangerous for us. We shouldn't have. We, it is. We, we. We. I don't want to live in. That's what he said. We, I don't want to live in an Iran that uh, most university graduates are female. Uh, so. The power elite tries to gain legitimacy through its regional policies. So um, when you present General Qasem Soleimani of the Iranian Revolutionary uh, Guard uh, in charge of uh, out, uh, foreign uh, operations, if you pay attention to the Iranian state media, he is presented as a hero. As, as a hero that is basically guarding Persian interests, national interests. And it's amazing that they, uh, that they refrain from using in the Iranian state media these days, uh, not always, but these days, they refrain from uh, re religious uh, references. They talk about Persian nationalism. They talk about Iranian national interests because they, they know that referencing to religious values and religious issues uh, doesn't have a market in Iran among the Iranian population and that is mostly the young um, so the Iranian power elite tries to buy legitimacy uh, internally through its proxies now within the Iranian uh, power dynamics we know that Jawad Zarif the Iranian foreign minister and his circle who are almost all if I remember correctly if almost all of them are American University educated um, uh, officials including the chief uh, nuclear uh, negotiator 
uh, after Zarif uh, Salehi, who is an MIT uh, gradu uh, graduate, and he actually studied uh, nuclear physics at MIT. So this is, this is basically the part of the Iranian power elite that is not very p powerful. Yes, they negotiated the nuclear accord in Vienna, but they're, they, they're, they don't write the checks. They're not decision makers. They're not the key decision makers. But they are in serious uh, rivalries within the Iranian power elite. They, want to, they basically argue that we should not focus so much of our foreign policy on, on proxy, uh, on, 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 uh, on leading proxy forces in the, in the region. And we should basically tone down on our military ex uh, uh, adventures in the region. And um, uh, as, as recently as a month ago or a month and a half ago, they were seriously criticized by head of the IRGC, uh, General Jafari, that no, this is our foreign policy and we're not going to change it. This is our national interests. So that's basically the dynamic among uh, the so-called liberal pro-Western uh, elite and their opponents in, uh, that mainly come from the IRGC, Iranian Re Revolutionary Guard Force. So what is the Iranian geopolitical direction going forward after the, uh, after the accord? Uh, given the animosity between Iran and the West, um, and which was reinforced this animosity was reinforced uh, under Ahmadinejad and the policies of neocons in the United States and elsewhere. Um, there, is, there is a faction in Iran, both on the military, uh, military side as well as on the political side, that, that have turned to Russia and China and see their future in, in, in an alliance with China and Russia, including joining SCO, uh, Shanghai Cooperation or, uh, Organization, versus those who believe that Iran should have a balance, keep, a, keep cordial ties with Russia and China, uh, and also uh, open up to the West and Western investment. So as we stand here today, that is at the heart of the Iranian political dynamics. And the hardliners basically have recent, as recently as over the past year, over the past year, and as recently, even more recently uh, as three months ago, they have targeted high, high and, I, and I'll tell you why they have targeted uh, them. They have decided to pursue targeting high profile, very high profile Iranian Americans who have visited Iran. One of them, as all of you know, is Washington Post reporter Jason Rezaian. And excuse me. No problem. Welcome. And um, as recently as two months ago, uh, Siamak Namazi, a very successful, high-profile Iranian American businessman, and with amazing connections to the oil and gas industry in the West and the United States, including Western Europe. He's in jail right now. So what the, the, the message that they're giving to the outside is don't even think of coming to Iran for investment. This is the faction that is closely allied with the West and, and, and Russia. And they are fearful for very legit, legitimate reasons. If I were one of them, I would probably pursue the same policies. For very legitimate reasons, they are deeply concerned about American, European, Canadian investment in Iran and, and the crumbling of their mini small empires within the Iranian economy. And we all know that, e that Iran, I, I'll, I'll get to the uh, investment and the economy in a few minutes, but Iran is basically the last, the last frontier that is not explored, unexplored frontier in, in, in global economy because of, because of the, uh, because of the uh, amazing demographics that it offers to investment investors. I'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, 
Now, the signing of the accord, the nuclear accord, is manifestation of the West agreeing, accepting Iran as a power that has the influence, that has the ability to influence events in a vast region. As I said in, uh, earlier, it is, a, it is not just a Shiite power, it is a, it is a cultural power. It is a cultural powerhouse. And it is bound, if things go in the right direction, if it, uh, it is bound to be a major economic powerhouse. Um, as, as, I said, because, as I said, because of those demographics that I will get to them later on. Um, However, Iran has its own commitments. Now, I'm not talking about technical com commitments when it comes to nuclear uh, technology. Iran has its own commitments to the West. And those commitments are mostly in the form of changing course in its foreign policy. Now, changing course in its foreign policy is the question how that change is going to happen and how that change is going to be resisted among Iran based on the dynamics that I just described. Um, Rouhani government and, and his, and his uh, circle are very careful not to antagonize the hardliners. They're trying to basically explain to hardliners that, listen buddy, you want to make money? You're making billions of dollars. Let's come to an understanding. You can still make a lot of money, but we need to abide by certain rules in, 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 in international affairs. We, need, we can make Iran a better place without your interests being jeopardized. That's a very uh, fine line that the Rouhani government and his circle are walking. Um, whether, they, whether or not they will be able to convince the other side that we need to change course, that is the $64,000 question. But how Iran will adopt or basically execute, execute on, on the change of the course of its foreign policy and, its, and the way it manages its economy, because it's a very corrupt economy, uh, that's that's going to that's going to its its impact will be felt widespread. Its impact can actually, if 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 it if it is done successfully and without any trouble, and unrest, its impact will be felt in the European economies, in the American economies. So that's why the European European companies have a lot of hope. Uh, on doing, on doing, in doing business with Iran, uh, and the hard, hardliners know something very well, and they don't deny it, but they do resist it. They know that the Iranian society is going uh, to, toward a totally different direction that they don't like. Um, they know that um, they know that the um, in let me give you an example in IT and uh, communication. Uh, Forty million Iranians are connected to the to the web, but it's not the type of connections that we have here. Um, it's very slow. They're very patient. They get on. They have all sort. When I visit Iranians recently coming here. They tell me about uh, filtering technologies that uh, is just mind-numbing. I, I feel like uh, I, I, don't have, I don't know anything about the internet. I, f I feel actually embarrassed. They, they tell me about how you can bypass that, that technology, how, how you can bypass uh, that side, uh, that, that filter. You can bypass this filter with this type of uh, technology. You can, there, there, are, there are a number of filters that you can use to get into Israeli sites. 
for example, they know the, if they want to check Israeli, Israeli newspapers, and a lot of them do, uh, they basically use a certain type of software. And they explain it to you when, they, uh, when, when you meet with them, and, and, and you just say, oh my god, uh, these are, uh, are, who are you, IT support? I mean, <laughs> and he or she happens to be an ordinary guy or ordinary girl. And, and this is basically cultural dynamics that Iranian hardline power elite is facing. Um, uh, and um, today at MIT, uh, some of their best students are, are coming from top Iranian universities. Uh, and it's among the top two uh, foreign uh, students. They basically, at MIT, you can see top of the cream of Iranian IT and Iranian researchers today at MIT. Um, now, going back, to the, um, going back to the economy, and then after economy, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about Daesh or ISIS um, and, uh, and how this ISIS story is going to in my opinion, how it's going to unfold and how it's going to impact the, the uh, regional countries. Uh, Iranian economy, Iran is an 80 million population. Um, uh, 60 percent of 60 percent of the population is under 35. If you want to go to 40 year old. It's 70 percent for up to 40 years under 40 years old. Um, the most urbanized uh, female population in in the region. Uh, the majority of them have a basic understanding of English, both written and and, and verbal. Um, uh, 40 million of the uh, 40 million inter internet users. Um, uh, because of the reasons that I just described, uh, Facebook and Twitter are still banned, even dis despite all the efforts by the Rouhani administration. The Rouhani government basically uh, tried and tried and tried and tried to open Twitter and Facebook. They basically said, shut up. They told him to shut up, basically. Sorry for my language. That's basically what, he, what they were told by the hardline IRGC uh, 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 officers because the internet and the telecom infrastructure in, in Iran is uh, very heavily uh, uh, controlled by both organizationally and, and, te uh, and te techno technologically by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Uh, so that hasn't happened yet, but, but if you go on Twitter and Facebook, it is mind-numbing the number of millions and millions of Facebook accounts and Twitter accounts from Iran. Um, so uh, the country, uh, the Iranian economy is aiming, is shooting for uh, $200 billion investment uh, in its oil and gas industry. It plans to buy 500 uh, passenger airplanes uh, to uh, to modernize its uh, aging fleet, and as you know, uh, uh, they didn't. Uh, as you know, a, a few week, a few weeks ago, uh, top executives, one or two, I believe, two, based on my information, two top executives from Bombardier uh, visited Iran. Um, uh, the, the the country plans to invest billions and billions of dollars in clean water technology uh, because of the gross mismanagement of uh, natural water sources under Ahmadinejad, mostly under Ahmadinejad. And uh, they have a, um, um, they're planning to, um, to invest over $100 million in uh, transportation uh, technology uh, over the next uh, five years. And $100 billion is only for five years. So it just gives you what a uh, what a, what a uh, uh, how investors could salivate when they look at these demographics in Iran, um, uh, and um, over the past six months or less than six months, 
over 4,000 C-level executives from Europe and United States. I'm not counting the Russians, I'm not counting the Chinese. 4,000 C-level executives have visited Iran just to look at the market and basically evaluate the uh, opportunities. And uh, for a period of time, this is, this is funny, for a period of time, because Iran doesn't have a uh, uh, advanced uh, tourism infrastructure, and tourism is another area they're planning to invest in billions. Because of poor tourism infrastructure, a number of executives basically stayed at their Iranian friends' uh, homes and apartments when they visited Iran. Um, so if you, if you look at the emergence of Iran as an economic powerhouse and, uh, and with the change of direction in its foreign policy, gradual change in its foreign policy, we're, we, are, we are very likely to see that we have a friend in, in, the, in the heart of the Middle East that is not anti-Western, it is not anti-American, and it is a bulwark against Sunni radical Islam. Um, <coughs> and that's one of the things, that's one of the key reasons, not the only reason, one of the key reasons that makes Iran a more stable society and country compared to a place like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, and Turkey. Because when you go to those societies, putting aside the government, when you go inside those societies, you see a fair amount of, some of them widespread, some of, uh, but you see a fair amount of anti-Americanism, anti-Western values, um, the desire to see Western societies being crushed, um, the, uh, the popularity of, uh, of fundamentalist values, uh, and of course, in some of these societies, um, maybe they, maybe they are small, but very potent, potent and dangerous uh, base of support for ISIS, and that's one of the key. That's one of the key uh, concerns in the in, within Turkish society that the Turkish security establishment today has what to do with, with, this, with the ISIS support, base of support within Turkish population. And they have, they have to be very careful. Um, now, speaking of ISIS, for Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and other key Arab regional states, ISIS was a strategic tool to undermine the Iranian interests and and basically put a stop, put a, put a break, not stop, put a, put a, put a break on Iranian uh, expansionism, especially especially in Syria. But let's let's not forget the Iranians have a lot of Syrian blood on their hands, as well as others, certainly Turkey and other players. And certainly the United States uh, um, administration. They, they used ISIS and they are still using ISIS as a, uh, as a strategic tool against Iran, hoping, maybe not today, but they initially hoped that ISIS can basically damage Iranian influence and Iranian, what they believe, what they regard as Iranian expansionism in the region. Uh, Turkey also used ISIS uh, to, uh, to garner domestic legitimacy. Erdogan used it very effectively over the past two elections. And, uh, uh, and we know that, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with Turkey. It is, as you know, it is sacrilegious in the West to talk about Turkish support for ISIS, but I'm going to be sacrilegious today. Um, uh, Turkey continues to buy uh, ISIS oil under Erdogan. Turkey continues to uh, to treat uh, ISIS uh, uh, soldiers who are injured in, uh, on the battlefront uh, in Turkish hospitals. And uh, going back to that hospital, there is a hospital uh, near Turkish 
Syrian border, uh, specifically treating uh, anti-Assad rebels, ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, the Nusra Front, and others, Al-Qaeda, uh, offshoots of Al-Qaeda. And that hospital is run and supervised by the daughter of President Erdogan. Um, ISIS continuously received uh, uh, arms shipment by MIT, uh, in, uh, which is Turkish uh, CIA, Milli Istihbara Teşkilatı in Turkish uh, language, which means Central Intelligence Agency, MIT. Um, and for Erdogan, geopolitically, ISIS could have been, I don't think, no, no longer today. If you look at the map, ISIS could, if, if we had a uh, successful Islamic State or Caliphate, uh, the way Erdogan and Saudi Arabia envisioned it, it would have cut off the Iranian hand from the Sunni heartland in Iraq, all the way going to Syria. And, and, it, and it, would base, it would have been a major geopolitical blow to the Iranian uh, strategic interests in the region, all the way going to the Levant. That didn't happen. For Saudi Arabia, uh, ISIS has been a tool to put a lid on the widespread, uh, widespread uh, on popularity of the Saudi royals within Saudi Arabia, and and by and you, by using ISIS and projecting power and basically demonizing the Iranians. The Iranians are 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 demonized brightly in, 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 in many ways, but I'm talking about I'm talking about Saudi strategic from from a Saudi strategic perspective. You can basically put by by, by this form, by this aggressive foreign policy and by and by supporting financially first and foremost uh, a barbarian group of people that is called ISIS you basically demonize a major regional power, which is Iran, and you postpone what is widely believed to be an eventual social unrest in Saudi Arabia that is bound to, have, is bound to happen, but I'm not a, I don't have a timeline on that. And for Qatar and, and Kuwait, we know that a significant amount of funding has been going to ISIS has been going to ISIS through individual wealthy Arabs, private private individuals in uh, in these countries, and the uh, and the and, and the figures are in the range of tens of millions of dollars. So uh, that is the this is basically what we have come to with regard to ISIS. And let's not forget that President Hollande of France also under pressure from its Arab allies, provided arms and facilitated funding to ISIS. Um, so that's basically uh, the situation within the region and with, with Iran. What is going to happen in Iran over the next several months and over the next year is the continuation of this rivalry between hardline elements within the Iranian power elite and the pro-Western elite. And this is going to be, uh, this is going to be crystallized in the February parliamentary elections. The February parliamentary elections is crucial in Iran um, because uh, already the under uh, uh, political rivalries have started with regard to the uh, with regard to the um, uh, parliamentary elections, and also the health of the Iran Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, if Ayatollah Khamenei was uh, ha anything happened to him, if he dies today, or if he basically uh, uh, resigns from power due to health reasons, 
we're going to see an inten in a very uh, uh, an intensification, a serious intensification of uh, power rivalries within Iran to the benefit of pro-Western power elite, uh, because a, a major obstacle will be removed from their on the, from uh, from their way towards towards making the policy, making the changes in their policies that they that they envision. And that's basically it. Um, uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I hope I didn't uh, bore you. And I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much. John, it's an honor to have you here. How are you? Thank you. Um, I guess I've got uh, two questions, but uh, the first one, I mean, young ideologues can, can live very cheaply, but old, late middle aged ideologues like to have a few number of business interests. So, what ha happens to, yeah. I never pronounced it right, but the, the Bonyads, the sort of. The Bonyads, yeah, yeah. The, the foundations. The religious foundations that dominated the uh, economy under the last century, are they uh, still struggling along trying to control the whole uh, economy or why? Uh, the Bonyads, or found, uh, Bonyad in Persian means foundation. Um, the foundations in Iran, we, there are a number of foundations that are uh, basically overflowing with cash, right? and there are billions and billions. Um, uh, they are mostly uh, controlled by the uh, by the hardliners and, and the religious elite. Um, the, the 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 overarching uh, discourse about these foundations is that we need to we need to reform them and make them pay taxes and you know where that where that uh, argument comes from i don't need to elaborate um, these bon these foundations have actually uh, been successful in in weathering the the sanctions in in, in reducing the sorry the re in reducing the impact of sanctions on Iran, because they they, they are flush with they have they have always been flush with cash, and they have been able to make purchases uh, that for for the economy uh, during the uh, harsh international sanctions that are gradually being lifted. Um, now the question as to what is going to happen to these foundations, uh, I can't predict, but. But if there is, if there is another wave of political success for the pro-Western and pro-American elite in Iran, they're definitely they're definitely going to go after uh, those uh, foundations because uh, they can. They don't want nobody. Want, I don't think that anybody can destroy them or or dismantle them, but they are fat targets, very fat targets for. for for tax, you can make a lot. The, the state can make a lot of money by taxing them. But what is going to happen to them? It is too early to make a prediction. The, the other question I had was that the Saudis, you know, taking act very subtly. Uh, and I think about eight or nine years ago, they bought some Chinese medium-range ballistic missiles and stuffed them in a warehouse. And then two years ago, they actually built a missile base and deployed them. Uh, but with the, the outcome of the talks, will they actually, do you think they'll be looking for warheads, perhaps from Pakistan, to, to go with their missiles? Uh, nuclear warheads? Yeah. No, the Pakistanis, uh, based, based on my understanding uh, of Pakistani st strategic thinking, the Pakistan, uh, Pakistan has close to 40 million Shiites. And uh, it is a population of 160 million. It's 40 million Shiites, extremely pro-Iranian. I've met with them, and I've talked to them, spoken to them. Incredibly pro-Iranian. And you sometimes, are you pro-Pakistan or pro-Iran? I mean, that question comes to your mind. Iran can wreak havoc in, in Pakistan and basically blow up the country with its 40 million Shiites if, if they decide to do so. But uh, the Pakistani strategic thinking is that we we need to keep a balance between our, when it comes to our 
military relationship with, with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia asked Pakistan to uh, contribute soldiers uh, for its invasion of uh, Yemen, for its operations in Yemen. The Iranians sent a diplomat, I can't recall unfortunately who he, who he was, but they sent someone to Pakistan and, they, and they, he stayed in Pakistan for 48 hours and came back. The Pakistani basically uh, told the, after that, the Pakistanis told the, uh, their Saudi allies that, uh, sorry, uh, this time we can't contribute any soldiers. Um, Pakistan, even if, even if you take Iran off the picture, Pakistan, if it genuinely tries to sell or provide warheads, nuclear warheads to, to Saudi Arabia, they're going to they're going to be faced with the wrath of international community in a very subtle and maybe uh, covert manner, if you know what I mean. And then I don't think even forget about the Iranians. I don't think they would be able to get away with it uh, uh, easily uh, because Saudi Arabia right now is. I mean, everybody is seeing what is the the um, the incredible danger that is the face is the, the West is facing China is facing Russia is facing from Wahhabi Sunni Islam fundamentalist Wahhabi Sunni Islam is this threat is simply mind numbing it, it is incredible and uh, I mean look at Hezbollah Hezbollah we all regard Hezbollah as a, as a terrorist organization yes an Iranian proxy, yes. Uh, when it comes at the right time, it can blow up a few uh, buses or or uh, Israeli outposts, military outposts, yes. But I don't want to get, give credit to Hezbollah, but Hezbollah is a far cry. It's a totally uh, animal from ISIS. I mean, if you genuinely compare Hezbollah to ISIS, Hezbollah is Switzerland, ISIS is Afghanistan. I mean, it's just mind-numbing. The level of violence that ISIS has committed is it, absolutely mind-numbing. Raping 10-year-old girls and then killing it after, after you rape her. It, I mean, I, I don't know how to describe it describe the level of violence and something you should know about the, uh, the religious elite in Saudi Arabia they openly encourage Sunni Muslims to kill Shiites or Iranians and they still regard the Jews as subhuman they don't talk about it any longer openly but but the Saudi religious elite still regard they're, 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 they have learned to become a little bit more politically correct they probably seen a few American movies but they are they still regard Jews as subhumans and, and they're not joking about it and this is the type of religious ideology that that the Western security security establishment, Chinese security establishment, Russian security establishment, Iranian security establishment is facing. And now, Mr. Erdogan of Turkey has to deal with it because it encouraged them and they didn't do anything. It's, it's, secure, it's, it's intelligence forces establishment. They didn't do anything about uh, their activities and their, and their um, and the way they promoted this ideology within Turkey and now you have Turkish nationals they're not Arabs they're Turkish nationals who are staunch supporters of ISIS and they can kill and, 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 they, and they are as brutal, brutal as uh, their Arab counterparts and this, we're talking about Turkey and major NATO power Eric um. You haven't talked about, uh, there are so many aspects I want to ask about, but you haven't talked about the direct military threat that ISIS poses to Iran. 
Uh, now, one of the things that we're seeing in the past six months is that ISIS is not making uh, serious advances on the ground any longer. It seems to be even regressing, uh, which possibly accounts for some of the uptick in terrorism in, in terms of opening second front. Uh, but uh, I'd, I'd like to know how you assess uh, their direct threat to Iran. ISIS thought, with this support from, from its Arab, Arab donors, they thought that they could pose a military threat to Iran. They even, they even, they even talked about making incursions into the Iranian territory from Iraq. Uh, the Iranians didn't take them seriously, they still don't take them seriously, but within Iran, inside Iran, uh, just to let you know that there, there are very, very few areas that Iran happens to be world class. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's only a few areas. And one of those very few areas that Iran is considered a world class, truly world class, is its intelligence, intelligence apparatus, intelligence services. You cannot mess with Iranian intelligence. And, and they have multiple organizations with the whole, a whole set of um, the responsibilities and, and activities and surveillance systems. An Iranian, I'll, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Just to let you know that right after the Paris, Paris bombings, an Iranian general from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard mockingly, mockingly said that if, if you guys, that is France, if you can't provide security for your own people in the heart of your capital, we can help you out on this. Um, of course, he was making fun of them for, their, for, for, their, for the failure of their intelligence. Uh, ISIS, uh, does not have the ability to pose a threat to Iran. It doesn't have the manpower, and it doesn't have the technology that the Iranians have. They, they would love to, they would, I mean, it is one of their dreams to, to blow up buses, schools, and uh, shopping malls in Iran, but um, I think that's one, of their, that's one of the things that they would <clears throat> love to see, first and foremost, the ability to have that's the ability they would love to have, but I don't think it's possible in Iran, given the intelligence apparatus in Iran. Uh, and they, they're hungry for Iranian blood. Having said that, there are many Arabs who are indignated for the right reasons uh, that, to despise the Iranian government and its policies because of the involvement of Iran in Syria and the support that Iran provided to Bashar al-Assad that has been instrumental in keeping Assad in power. Um, and one other thing in Syria, Russia has dealt serious blow to all factions, including ISIS. I don't buy the Western media uh, claims that Russia doesn't do anything to ISIS. That's propaganda, it's understandable. You want, to, you want to basically put down the other side. That's quite normal. But Russia has dealt significant blow to the ISIS in Syria. Can you say how? What in, are the specifics of that? The intelligence that they received from Assad government, the intelligence that they received from Iranian forces on the ground, um, and, uh, and the, uh, the, te uh, the technology that they have. Sukhoi 34, Suko, the very advanced jet, Russian jet fighters uh, that basically came to service only in 2008 or 2009, and they are world-class jet fighters. Um, they have been very effective in, um, in uh, uh, inflicting pain on ISIS. Um, and the Americans have admitted that Sukhoi 34s uh, have done an amazing job in Syria. The Americans have admitted to that. Yes? Going a little further with your, your description between your, your comparison between Hezbollah and, and, and ISIS, how would you view uh, uh, an ISIS social 
agenda versus versus a restricted re regime like the Taliban? Are they <coughs> comparable? Are they different? No, sir. They're Taliban, right? Not Hezbollah. Between no, I'm talking about the Taliban. Okay. ISIS and Taliban have many things in common. Um, I, I, really, I am really reluctant to give any credit to Taliban because they are as savage, in my opinion, as an ISIS. But, but the Taliban didn't rape little kids. Taliban didn't rape little girls. Taliban did not encourage raping women and children. Taliban did not encourage uh, uh, giving arms to teenagers to kill a bunch of people. I mean, the differences are not significant, but uh, uh, ISIS, ISIS is like uh, out of this world, truly out of this world. Yes. Um, so I want to see if I can get some information on about the economy. Back in the late 70s, Canadian companies were very active in Iran. Yes. Uh, building all sorts of things. That had to tail off for various reasons, including the public regard. Um, and several years ago, an acquaintance of mine who was Iranian uh, had gone home to see her for her grandmother's funeral. And in speaking with her cousins, she indicated that Imagina Dad had basically destroyed the uh, primary and high school curriculum and had eliminated all the sciences, her cousins were saying, had eliminated a lot of the sciences, if not all of them, and the engineering type studies and those sorts of physics studies. Um, the reason Canadians got in is because of the high level engineers we have and scientists. Is that true? Did he basically turn everything towards a religious bent in the grade school no. in that? No. no. Uh, Ahmadinejad made changes to the Iranian curriculum uh, because of their obsession with Islam. They eliminated some of the uh, a portion of history books uh, that dealt with pre-Islamic Persia and the Persian glory, so to speak, if you want to use that term. And uh, they also tried to ban women uh, because of the trends that I told you, uh, that I described in, in, in earlier, they, they decided to ban a number of uh, disciplines, women, banning women from pursuing a number of disciplines. Uh, Rouhani government uh, reversed those restrictions. And Rouhani government also is, in addition to their failure to put, to open the social media, they have also tried to uh, open the stadiums, um, athletic stadiums to women, because women are barred by the religious elite from entering uh, stadiums. Um, and um, they have actually raided women, ordinary women have raided some of these stadiums and they, they got into clash with security guards. Um, uh, so, the religious elite is fearful of the crumbling, the crumbling of revolutionary ideals in Iran, which is happening. Sorry, it's happening. If, I mean, that's bad news for you, for, for, for them. Yes, please. Sir, uh, two questions. Do you believe that the, what is your, your, your judgment in regard to Iran in the next decade developing its own <coughs> atom bomb. And secondly, in the Global Mail this morning, there was an article that suggested that they will be ex starting to export half a million barrels of oil a day. And that works out to about $7 billion a year. And since it is oil, and since governments are using it well, that means a massive influx of money to the hardline top government. What are the implications of that? Um. Since the signing of the nuclear accord, uh, Iranians uh, have tried to uh, boost their production. They are believed to be able, uh, by independent sources, they are believed to be able to boost production by 500,000 uh, barrels a day by sometime around February. But they have 32, between 30 and 32 million 
barrels of oil sitting on, in tankers at sea. There are, they have started to sell those, uh, that, that, that oil as well. So those 30 million, 32 million barrels of oil have been sitting on, in tankers over the past maybe two years, over two years, uh, because of sanctions, they couldn't sell it. And, and, the, and the likely customers were, were afraid of buying them because of uh, American sanctions and the likely repercussions. Now, they, are, they have started to sell that oil. Now, who's going to get that money? That money is going to be spent, without a doubt, on purchasing arms over the next several years and months by the IRGC, Revolutionary Guards. That money is going to be spent, a portion of it, uh, on Hezbollah to uh, uh, reinforce Hezbollah uh, and its expenses. That money is going to be spent on Bashar al-Assad government and its, uh, and its economy. Uh, that money is going to be spent on, on uh, Iranian intelligence uh, and its operations. Uh, and, um, and the Revolutionary Guards outside Iran and their activities outside Iran. Um, but without a doubt, that money is going to be spent on infrastructure because Iran needs to upgrade its infrastructure in many areas. Um, is, it going to is it going to make a change on Iranian ability on the ground? Not really, because even under the sanctions, Iranians were Iranians were able to do whatever they wished. They, they, uh, they basically brought American military in Iraq under the occupation almost to their knees by supporting everyone in the conflict, including the Sunnis. The Iranians provided ammunition and bombs to the Sunnis who were willing to fight Americans on, during the American occupation of Iraq. Uh, so their hands were, they, they were free to do whatever they, they wished, geopolitically speaking. But adding a few millions of dollars to their coffers <laughs> is not going to make a significant uh, impact. But I am expecting, I am expecting, and there are many others who expect Iran will make some changes, even under the hardliners, some changes to certain aspects of its foreign policy uh, over the over the next year or two, but if it were if it were if the if the Rouhani administration and and Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif uh, if they had their way the changes would be would be significant. You didn't answer really my first question. The bomb. What is what is oh the bomb? Oh, I, I totally forgot. <laughs> Whether they're planning to bomb, build a bomb over the next 10 years, is that the question? Yes. No. Uh, I, my, my initial answer is no, but, I, I, have, I have a but in my answer, B-U-T. <laughs> and, that, and that is, uh, they can make an attempt at building the actual bomb at great repercussions, at, at great risks, very great risks. So that's why my initial answer is no, they're not. The, but do, do not, let's not forget something about the Iranian nuclear program. Always remember this country, Japan, Japan, Japan. Their strategy has always been with sanctions, without sanctions. The Iranian strategy is a copycat of Japan. The ability to build a bomb over the next few weeks, but don't have a bomb. You have a bottle of wine. You're not, you, you, you promised your doctor you will never ever drink it. But if, if the doctor dies or something happens, <laughs> you can, it's a matter of basically getting a corkscrew and, and open it and start drinking it. But that bottle of wine is always and always sitting there. So there, the, 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 what I mean by carbon copying the Japanese strategy is that the, I, we, we all know we all know that Japan, Japan has the ability to put together a bomb in a matter of a few weeks. Or maybe Iranians, a few months. Maybe they're not as smart as Japanese technologically, I don't know. Um, that's the Iranian strategy. And that's why my initial answer is no. That is why. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Could you say a word about uh, the Kurdish dimension? Because the Kurds are a problem in most of the countries in the region. Yes. That's, a, that's an amazing question and topic of a whole uh, <laughs> theory, series. Um, The Kurds have been used and, and misused by regional states against each other. Going back to the 70s, the Shah of Iran used the Kurds in northern Iraq to undermine Saddam Hussein. Everybody knows that. Uh, after the revo Iranian Revolution, the Kurds in Turkey uh, were used by Iran against the Turkish state. So that, that's in that's in 80s, up until early 90s. The Kurds <clears throat> in northern Iraq, the government of the Kurdish uh, re region in northern Iraq is an ally of, believe it or not, uh, Erdogan of Turkey, President Erdogan of Turkey. They have had cordial relations uh, because because the government of northern Iraq, Kurdistan, they were seriously opposed with, to PKK, PKK of Turkey, the Kurdish militant group in Turkey that is fighting an independent, independence war against the Turkish state. But they have, they have had very, uh, very um, bad relationship with the, um, very rocky relationship with the, since, since the emergence of the Kurdish government in northern Iraq. They don't get along with each other. That's why the government of Turk, Kurdish, uh, Iraq, uh, Kurdish government in northern Iraq has has had a good relations with Erdogan, and Erdogan has always exported their oil, their oil, of from Kirkuk. You know, Kirkuk is a major oil. Uh, Kirkuk is basically a ver version of Calgary or Edmonton in in, in northern Iraq, and and the oil from Kirkuk has always been exported to European markets through Turkey uh, with the blessing of uh, Turkish state, and that is government of Erdogan. Now, the, the Kurds in Iran, if you, if you go to Kurdish areas in Iran, and then you go to Kurdish areas in Syria, and then in Iraq, and then in Turkey, the, uh, the most developed part is the Turkish area in Iran. And... Um, they have also they have also have had serious differences with the Iranian government. They have fought. Uh, 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 they have they have fought uh, against the Iranian state at certain periods. Um, but the Iranian government has had a relatively. I don't want to give too much credit to the Iranian government. Relatively better treated compared to their brethren in, in, other, in other regional states. Certainly, certainly better than the Kurds in Turkey. They have had a, they have had a better treatment. Uh, the Kurds in Syria is a geopolitical threat to Turkey's, uh, based on Turkish security uh, establishment and their outlook. The Kurds in Syria poses, they pose a uh, threat to to Turkish uh, territorial integrity. If the if the Kurds in northern Syria can create their own government, and we have a similar situation in northern Iraq, Kurdish government in northern Iraq, they can basically merge and become one state, and that will be a huge boost to the Kurds in Turkey. And that's the strategic threat to the Turkish state. And Erdogan will do anything in its power to basically prevent that from, prevent that from happening. And in this case, Erdogan has an ally, and that is the Iranian government in this particular area. Time for one more question. Yes, please. Um, there have been reports recently in the Western media of an intensified crackdown on internal dissent in Iran, whether it's perceived or real. Uh, I'm wondering, do you regard this uh, intensified uh, crackdown as 
a, a SOP to regime elements that are disgruntled with the Iran, uh, with, the, with the recent nuclear deal? Or do you think that this crackdown is more a reflection of real concerns that the nuclear, nuclear accord could provide, could serve as, as could galvanize um, um, sentiment in favor of, of more social, of a loosening of social restrictions. You nailed it, actually. Yeah. I don't need to explain. You nailed it. So I, if, I, I, if that's the case, then, wouldn't you say that if, if there is this real fear um, among uh, significant factions of, of the regime that that there is this threat of, of, of internal dissent being galvanized by the nuclear accord. Doesn't this act as a break against, you were talking about how, uh, in looking toward the future, you were, you were talking about how you think that, that the, the relatively pro-Western elements of the regime, um, that, that the future is theirs. Wouldn't you say that, 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 that this sentiment uh, inside the regime, and significant factions of the regime, well, don't you think this acts as a break against um, Iran opening up uh, their, uh, to, the, to the West and to the rest that's of the world? That's their goal. That, that's their goal. They want to basically, they, they, they want to uh, put a break, put obstacles along the way towards more opening. Mm -hmm. Because of their religious ideology, their, their state ideology are, are threatened and also uh, most importantly, they have uh, economic interests. Yeah. Um, in Iran, the in Iran, the smuggling economy is worth is estimated at about a twenty five billion dollars annual. That's the that's the uh, and and the, a, a significant portion of this twenty five billion dollar uh, smuggling economy is managed by these hardline groups. Uh, imagine, imagine bringing a competition to this market. They are, they are inevitably toasted. Um, and sooner or later, many, many observers, many people, many ordinary people think that's going to happen. Um, and I wrote a piece for the Hill Times and I basically encouraged the liberal government to act as a, um, as a force to strengthen the Iranian middle class and strengthen the Iranian uh, economy by basically by basically breaking breaking these monopolies. Uh, I mean, contributing to the breakup of these monopolies. And the, and the Canadian comp Canadian companies have not not only do they have in, incredible uh, opportunities in Iran. Start with the uh, prairies, the agriculture. They those guys in prairies can make multiple, multiple billions of dollars from the Iranian market. Oil and gas, I don't need to explain. Uh, Bombardier, imagine Bombardier even managing to buy, to sell 75 planes to Iran. They're, pl they're planning to buy 500 planes anyway. And the significant portion of those 500 planes are going to be used for Iranian domestic market and regional, uh, regional uh, market, regional airports, maybe going to Iraq or going to neighboring Turkey. That's basically, whose market is that? That's Bombardier's market. Mm -hmm. um, the clean water technology, Canadians can have, Canadians can make multiple billions of dollars if, in that market. It, it's this mind-numbing uh, how, if there is a will in Canada, how Canadian companies can uh, can contribute to the Iranian economy and, and make a lot of money in the process. Any more? Any more questions? My brain is full. Uh, Rest <laughs> outstanding. <laughs> Thank you very much. You, Thank, you. You, you've Thank you for listening. Yeah, you, you've wet our appetite for uh, I mean, <coughs> part the, which is to talk about, the, as you almost said it, it's the subject of another presentation about the birds. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, exceptionally complicated part of the world. Thank you. And uh, it's all in your head, and uh, there's just so much to get out and share with us. If I was to, to, to uh, ask a question, uh, this is a rhetorical question, and it relates to the economy. If we have this endemic culture of corruption in Iran, 
that in and of itself becomes a culture, um, the impact of that, what would the impact be on uh, the international community coming in and selling, marketing their wares, purchasing exports from Iran? Because we've got uh, world, the World Trade Organization, each country in and of itself has its own rules and regulations on how you conduct business in societies, and especially in societies that have human rights uh, uh, issues, as we, we see, uh, how much that will stymie uh, the world's efforts to get in there and profit. That's um, a very good question. Um, you don't have to answer it. You don't want it. So, uh, I can answer it. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah, that's a good, very good question. Actually, um, um, Iran has a massive ma middle class. The size of the middle class in Iran is massive, but very weakened, seriously weakened. And a portion of that middle class is basically made of university graduate, young university graduates who cannot properly find a job, who cannot properly, like here, um, send a resume and get an interview in because of the corruption and because of the relationships that matter. Now, what they love to see is basically Western companies setting up shops and start hiring because they know that, that their hiring practices are far more different from the way it happens in Iran. And, uh, and the Grohani government has made, has made some reforms, uh, anti-corruption reforms. Um, you have to give them credit, but those reforms are not widespread. And um, uh, Iranian Americans, the Iranian American community, which is very strong in, in the United States, both financially and increasingly uh, uh, in social political area, but particularly financially, the Iranian American community have done over the past even I, I'm tempted to say five months over the past five months they've done they have uh, organized a whole range of seminars both in the United States and and inside Iran uh, on on entrepreneurship on launching a company um, uh, uh, on uh, on on a whole range of business issues, um, on man management courses, and this is this is a very positive force. This is a great positive force because many people do not approve of the corruption in the country, but sometimes you have to pay the bribe, right, to to get your daughter or your son to go to the next uh, job or whatever. But 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 the culture. The, the culture is against these practices because the hardliners in Iran control so many things uh, and that's why they're very afraid of what the, the direction that the country is, is, is the, the direction that the country has um, uh, uh, Omid Kurdistani the, the uh, number two one of the top executives at Google who, who basically launched Google with uh, the founders, Omid Kurdistani, the Iranian American, who escaped the, re the revolution and uh, came to America, the United States with his mom. Uh, he basically launched Google with, with the founders. And recently he became, I believe, CEO or chairman of Twitter. Uh, he's, I'm using him as an example. He's promoting uh, strengthening the of, of, of young Iranians in Iran uh, with technology, and he's basically talked about uh, re after the removal of sanctions, investing in technology and and, uh, and <coughs> in Iran and launching basically Iranian helping Iranians launch their own technology companies. Uh, this is a very positive force, and we have similar things here in Canada, and. Uh, uh, the point is, um, the point is, the the, the hardliners <coughs> who have to control so many things are eventually going to give up, and uh, we are hoping that 
that relinquishing their power and, 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 and their weakening will be peaceful, most likely it will be peaceful, but it's a, but it's a little bit rocky. Just in support of what Chris was saying, we still have to deal with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is still in place in the U.S., and the Securities Exchange Commission of Canada rules, both of which affect Canada. So we yes. got to be careful. Bang on. Nobody's going to break those rules because you go to jail. Uh, the European, uh, European sanctions were removed uh, a few weeks ago. I think there is a major removal of sanctions uh, sometime in March. In the United States, I don't have the exact date, but that, that takes place in March. The the question was not about sanctions; it was about foreign corrupt practices. Yes. Uh, and sanctions are no sanctions. If you bribe an Iranian, you go to jail. Yes. I don't recommend. That. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This concludes today's webcast. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for listening. You can keep up with coming events at the RCMI by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. We hope you'll tune in again, and we hope to see you in person at coming events. Thank you and goodbye.